say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Carried. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we now come to items uh, 9 and, and 10, and I want to advise um, councillors that these two items will be taken together. Uh, what I propose to do is have Councillor Cooper to introduce um, the, uh, the recommendations from the hearing panel, uh, but then move straight to the item number 10, which is a paper in my name, which sets out a set of alternative recommendations. Uh, it's my proposal to you that we vote on the recommendations on item 10, and should that be passed, then that would overtake the recommendations of item number nine. So I, I think that's the logical way of doing it. Um, just to point out to councillors that um, the, this discussion is not taking place in a vacuum. We've had now two workshops on it. Uh, the first workshop where councillors had the opportunity to uh, indicate their concerns and I participated in that and indicated that that's the feedback that I'd had from the general public as well. Uh, and the second workshop where the recommendations in my name were put before councillors present uh, to test the waters. And I think there was, um, there was uh, if not a consensus, close to a consensus, that these recommendations would be the, uh, the preferable way to go. And I say that in no way uh, in criticism of the hearing panel. I believe that the hearing panel and officers put an enormous amount of work into this uh, and a lot of time. And they felt that they were bound by a piece of legislation, which is the Freedom Camping Act, uh, which uh, set out clear principles that uh, councils were meant to follow. We're not happy with that act. Uh, Councillor Cooper and I have both written to the Minister, and uh, I think councillors are aware that we've had a positive response from the Minister, that he's happy to meet at the end of this month uh, and to consider options, and that further work could be done on the Freedom Camping Act and I think that that would be a good thing. In the meantime, because the law is the law where it is at the moment, we've got to work within the parameters subscribed, but we need to work to find how we can get the best outcome within those parameters. So I'll come back to that shortly, but can I first uh, invite Councillor Cooper to present uh, on autumn number nine? Thank you, um, Mr Mayor, and I guess this is a bit of a moot point now, but I think that it does provide context for item 10, and I want to ask you to bear with me to read out what we have done and where we came to so that you can understand where we're going to next and to acknowledge the huge amount of work that our staff have done in our policy bylaws team. I can't fault them. Um, and also in the communications team going out for submissions and also to the thousands of people who submitted, because effectively this makes a lot of their submissions invalid, which is a bit of a shame. But um, I think that um, where we will hopefully land and item 10 gives us a way forward. So first, um, the panel is presenting its recommendations on the proposed Auckland Council Freedom Camping and Vehicles Bylaw. And I had with me Councillor Hulse and IMSB member um, Tohenere, um, deliberating on the panel and going out to listen to the public. Um, and thank you to them. In September 2018, the Regulatory Committed, Committee provided direction on the content to be included, included in the draft bylaw. That came back as a draft statement of proposal in November to the Regulatory Committee. Unfortunately, it was voted down and a general rule was removed by seven councillors which actually has now put it in the place where it is unworkable in its current form, though the recommendations in this item nine report would have given a way forward, I do support the way forward that the Mayor is proposing in item 10, um, though it will make it much longer and um, will effectively mean we have to go out for full consultation on the whole thing again. Uh, so on the 22nd of November, the governing body unanimously adopted it to go out without a general rule. And it became the statement of proposal. It was uh, publicly notified for consultation from the 3rd of December to 18th of February, an unprecedented 10-week consultation. Um, the proposal included 318 years pro prohibited, 94 areas restric restricted for self-contained vehicles only, 13 
with permission to use for non-self-contained. And at the close, we had 2,694 submissions. We also received late submissions. Submitters raised 70 additional specific areas which were not included as scheduled in the areas of statement of proposal and 13 broad areas not scheduled in the proposed bylaw. Those 70 will be uh, uh, talked about in item 10. After consideration, the panel recommended 36 amendments to the, to the specified areas. So we increased the prohibited areas to 322. 94 areas restricted, though they weren't all the same. There were some changes, but it did result in the same numbers. And nine areas, we reduced the areas that could be used for non-self-contained vehicles after public submissions. So the panel finalised deliberations on the 18th of July on how to adopt and implement the proposed bylaw to provide the best level of protection to non-scheduled areas in the absence of some form of general rule. And if people don't know what that means, it's actually how do we protect the streets around our areas. And we do have legacy bylaws for that at the moment, but we have no teeth in those, and they are inconsistent right across the region. So we'll still be in that limbo phase until we have a freedom camping bylaw. So our recommendations on the principles of the bylaws, specific clauses, specific scheduled areas, non-scheduled areas, and non-regulatory matters raised are recorded in attachment A of the report. And the panel recommendations support the intent of the proposal. Um, and we, you will see we had um, recommendations in the report, but I also um, ask that um, and, uh, with consultation and the workshops, I think we've come to a place where those wouldn't be supported and that would be a waste of time bringing this just to not have a way forward. So I think um, I do support the Mayor's recommendation on item 10 because we've developed them together as a council, though it was a bit of a low turnout at the last workshop, but the first workshop had a full and frank discussion, and I think that we've heard what people have had to say, um, both elected and non-elected, and um, we need to move forward with this. We do have to come to some landing. We, Unless the legislation changes, we don't have any way to really enforce and discourage people from parking in places we don't want them in. Um, so let's um, move forward. So I am, um, in this case, uh, so I am, so I'm not to put any recommendations forward. This just sits here, but these recommendations here will mean that item nine is dealt with in the Mayor's report. So thank you, and thank you to everybody involved. Well, thank you very much, Councillor Cooper, and I do want to repeat my thanks to you, to Councillor Hulse, to Member Hinare, uh, and to officers for the work that went into that. Um, I, I want to, with the, uh, with the concurrence of councillors, just explain a little bit about um, Paper 10. It's a little unusual that uh, there should be a paper in the name of the, the Mayor. Uh, but this is something that has evolved through our council processes of having considered uh, the hearing panel's recommendations and workshops, of working through those recommendations. Of um, I had personal concerns, other councils had concerns. We listened to what the public was saying to us about this, and we really wanted to. <laughs> We, we heard from officers last time at, well, I think at the, at the uh, workshop, that there are other councils that have amended their bylaws, you know, two, three, four times. Because every time you amend it, there's something else that comes up and cons that, that has to go back to public consultation. And I think the mood of councillors was, let's try to do this once and do it right. Uh, and we didn't want to put forward something that only was a half measure. Uh, I agree entirely with Councillor Cooper. Uh, it was a mistake not to include a general rule, and Councillor Cooper, you and, and uh, the Deputy Mayor got that one right, I think, in the, the regulatory committee. Um, but there are a range of other things that we need to do. We do hope that the government, uh, it's not the government's uh, law, it was passed in 2010, that they, that they may be flexible. But we can't sit here for, you know, the two or three years that it might take for the government to get it right. One thing that was right in the government law was that it does give us enforcement powers uh, that are infringement notices, and that aspect of it we welcome uh, and will be a big step forward. What we've tried to do in the paper that I've put forward 
is to indicate that even within the constraints of the existing law, we do have the ability to tighten the rules. And what we're doing in Paper 10 is setting out what we think should be in the statement of, of proposal and asking officers to come back with free and frank advice. Now, officers may or may not agree with some of the things that we put forward. And it's their, their, not their right, but it's their obligation to say if they don't agree and why not. But in the end, it will be this body that sets the rules for uh, the bylaws. But we will do that after listening to the advice. And my belief is that we should try to make that statement of proposal as full as possible so we're not constantly coming back on things that we've heard in submissions but weren't put out to consultation. So there are a number of recommendations that are made there. Firstly, that there should be a general rule. And I think we need to consider what the nature of that general rule should be so that it is um, clearly all-encompassing uh, but doesn't involve uh, any, any suggestion that our officers should be moving people who are homeless on because of, of uh, this, this rule. Um, you know, we have to have a compassionate approach. We've got to solve the problem of homelessness. These rules are about freedom camping, people voluntarily staying in areas um, that may be within the city, uh, residential areas or uh, on our parks. I think we should include all of the recommendations that the hearing panel made. I think they've worked through uh, and they've extended the list of prohibitions and restrictions and we should adopt that as part of the new statement of, uh, uh, of proposal and we should add in the additional areas that are proposed by the public uh, that should be then available to be consulted on. I do not believe we should be removing Reserve Act prohibitions on freedom camping in areas adjacent to residential areas. And that's my suggestion for, for uh, inclusion in a statement of proposal, which officers will then report back on. Uh, I think that we won't have got this list totally right, and we have created the opportunity for local boards and for you as councillors to come back to us with anything else that you believe officers should consider for inclusion in the statement of intent. Uh, and that's, that's pretty wide-ranging, but it gives you the chance to reflect the concerns in your areas about what should be prohibited. I want to make the point that the legacy bylaws that we have at the moment ought not to expire in October next year. They can be, from the legal advice of council officers, extended at the minimum to October 2022, and I'm not suggesting we take that long to get this through. But while we are considering fully and thoroughly what needs to be in this bylaw, those legacy bylaws remain in place. And I want to finish just with a, a, a general comment. We know from the information given to us that freedom camping is growing. We also have a wider concern that while we welcome tourism, the pressure of tourism on our parks and reserves and on our facilities grows with that. And in our Destination Auckland document that was uh, put forward by Auckland uh, Tourism uh, and uh, e Events and Economic Development, they talked, I think, quite properly about preferring quality tourism over quantity of tourism. And I want to make one other point having been a freedom camper myself, so I'm not being hypocritical about it. Um, I've looked at the provision of camping grounds around our city uh, by DOC, by Auckland Council and by commercial operators. And the average price per person for a camping ground is about $23 a night. That's not prohibitive. Uh, and those are areas that are specifically provided for camper vans. Those are areas where the facilities are there for people, whether it's the showers, the toilets, uh, doing your laundry, um, uh, emptying your, 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 uh, your tanks there. So, you know, the default position in my mind is if you've got these camping grounds available and they are modestly priced, so you're not you're not discriminating against people because they can't stay in the Hilton or the, the Park Hyatt, then that's the first and the best place for the overnight campers to be. 
but we will consider, as the legislation requires us to consider, whether, whether there are other places that could be used without infringing on the public right to expect the reserves to be there for everybody and not dominated by people that are camping there overnight. Uh, and that these are facilities that we, the ratepayers, are paying for. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, if people are coming to enjoy our city, we, we welcome that, um, but they need to contribute uh, to the facilities that we've provided. So hopefully that sets some context. Uh, I haven't got officers at the table at the moment. Uh, I will bring them forward if required. Uh, but we have developed these proposals collectively and thoroughly after listening to the public. So I'm, I'm open for any questions that we have, then for any comments, um, but I don't need, believe that this needs to be a prolonged process. Right, um, questions from councillors. Councillor Newman, first question. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Oh, oh, sorry, um, just sorry, sorry to interrupt, Councillor. Uh, I will move those recommendations. Councillor Cooper will second those recommendations. My apologies, Councillor. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Your Worship. A question and then a quick comments. I'll do the question now. Um, with respect to um, uh, the recommendation five, any specific proposal for possible inclusion in the statement of proposal is communicated to the Chief Executive by a council or local board before 30 September 2019. Can I understand how this change position is going to be communicated back to local boards in time for them to consider um, the consequences of this and to provide that information back in a timely way to meet that deadline. Yeah, um, this is probably where I do need officers here. Um, my presumption is that we will, if we pass these recommendations today, we will send them out immediately. Every every councillor, of course, will be here to participate, uh, but we will send them out immediately to local boards, which will give them uh, about five to six weeks to come back to us uh, with suggestions. And these are suggestions that will be included uh, in our recommendations that that officers will then report back on. Uh, if if I get a lot of feedback that this is impossible, you could extend it. But then, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of what Councillor pa uh, of Chair you know, Parfitt said to us before. Um, we need to do this properly, um, but we don't want this to drag out because the sooner that we have provisions in place that include enforcement powers through infringement notices, the more effective we can be in making what what the prohibitions are in this a reality. Yep. Uh, okay, perhaps I'll take the comment a little bit later, uh, Councillor, and just see if there's any other questions. Um, Councillor, oh, sorry, I've got it. Councillor Sayers, first on the list. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. Um, Your Worship, it's just for clarification, to gain more clarification around the statement that you um, said relating, I think, to the um, pu public places bylaws that are current. Um, so if we were if we were under pressure time-wise, and we had to extend, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you're saying, I think you said that we could extend those out, you know, a few months, whatever the time frame required would be needed. Is that decision that would be made? by the governing body, or can, does that go through the Rick Tree Committee to, to, to make that change? Uh, we, we will, when, the, when we get to the point of making the statement of proposal, be working through the normal channels of the regulatory committee and then coming back to the governing body. Um, so the difficulty is, um, you know, I've thought quite a lot about the, the 30th September date. I thought six weeks is generally a reasonable amount of time to get feedback. But if we don't do it then, actually you're putting it back by, by months. And uh, I would rather, while doing it thoroughly, try to get something in place so that we can maximise our ability to potentially, but not, not absolutely guaranteed, have something uh, uh, by the end of next year. OK? Councillor Watson. Comment, Councillor Cooper, question or? I think it was just clarifying that because it's in, in your recommendation C is we're going to extend the legacy bylaws. Yes. Um, so they, a, a previous um, 
governing body um, resolution and said that we were going to let it lapse on 21st, 31st of October 2020. If you look at C, it's saying we're going to keep it going. So we'll actually, yep. um, we are going to extend it. No, no, that's that's absolutely correct. So I don't know if, yeah. um, the the original resolution, which we are entitled at this governing body to replace with the new recommendation, was that it would lapse uh, at the end of October next year. We now have legal advice that uh, that bylaw, those bylaws, can stay in place um, with the er the earliest possible date where where they might have to be uh, uh, allowed to lapse being October 2022. So we, we have plenty of time, but that does, shouldn't mean that we take two years to do what we can do uh, potentially much quicker. OK, Councillor Walker, question. First of all, um, I'm assuming that we're able to address questions to both um, items 9 and 10, that's the case? Yes, but, but remembering that that uh, the recommendations in 9 will be subsumed if we pass these recommendations in 10, and I'm putting recommendation 10 first, with the presumption, because we've talked about this on several occasions, that the recommendations in 10 will pass. So we, we, we shouldn't dwell on 9, which will simply be, according to recommendation uh, uh, B uh, in 10, they, that we will defer any decision on uh, those recommendations from the hearing panel. I've got a few questions, and uh, probably they're directed at, um, at yourself because it's item 10 that's okay, therefore that's more good. relevant than, than 9. Um, quite obviously, there's an issue around urgency because there are many people in the community that are pretty upset about um, freedom camping as it is right now and particularly around the issue that goes to enforcement, because we know that bylaws, frankly, don't work unless they're enforced, and we know that there is an expectation on the community that there is significantly more enforcement than our policy allows. So my question is, um, is frankly, around the, uh, the urgency of putting a regime in place, and that might involve volunteers, particularly in issues like Rodney and Hibiscus Coast, where there is a problem, and the timeline that you would suggest on making that happen, given that this council has not got too many days to run. OK, um, I've, I've invited uh, Megan and Katarina up to the table because Megan has some, done some work on compliance. Uh, I just want to say that um, what we're looking at is what we need to ensure compliance with. Compliance has always been an issue and will continue to be an issue. We need to look at how we might better do that. Uh, some of the discussion that we had in relation to uh, uh, Chair Parfitt's uh, presentation to the committee revolves around the idea that you've just mentioned and I mentioned in response to her, the idea of having honorary ranges. Sure. And I, I used to be one once. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I quite like that idea but with two, two prerequisites. One, that you appoint people who are appropriate people to do that job, because I think we've all been on committees with the school committees or whatever, where some people uh, would love to exercise authority but don't quite have the temperament to do it uh, properly. And uh, well, that's not too fine a point, I don't think, Councillor. Um, and secondly, uh, is to make, to make sure that we have appropriate training. But I think we need a much broader discussion. And what I proposed earlier in this meeting was that we should have this discussion, whether we do that before or after the election's a moot point. But just on the question of uh, compliance, because Megan hasn't had a chance to raise uh, with us the work that she's been doing, uh, Megan, if I can ask you to, to talk to the question of compliance. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, look, just uh, confirming that we understand uh, the concerns raised around summer, uh, and as uh, Chair Parfit uh, raised, we've been doing a lot of work, uh, the compliance team have been doing work uh, in various areas, including in Hibiscus Bays around this. So for this coming summer, just want to confirm that we are going to use interns uh, we and trained, um, as the Mayor has said, uh, to continue the, the kind of service that um, Chair Parfit was talking about. We will be working around the region, uh, but we will have additional staff and there will be additional compliance um, around the freedom camping for this summer. Um, 
a couple of further questions that go to this. So one, there's the issue of enforcement that goes to people and people on, on the ground. Uh, quite obviously, there's a related issue that goes to the budget for that and the, and the necessity for that. The third thing is the necessity for effective signage. Because right now, in many locations, the signage is woefully inadequate. And we certainly know that signage is very effective, particularly signage combined with enforcement. So those yeah. two latter things, budget and signage. Yeah. Could I just mention on the enforcement issue, and it's, I'm sure it's in your mind and other councillors, um, we know at the moment, under existing bylaws, that the only way of enforcing is to take somebody to court. And the Freedom Camper has long since left the city and sometimes the shores by the time we do that. The enforcement, however, can be as simple as informing people that have, that have just um, parked their van and put the awning out and put the barbecue out that there is no uh, provision for freedom camping in this area, and generally people will will take that and act without having to be prosecuted. The additional advantage, of course, of the law when we get these bylaws passed and we take that part of the Freedom of Camping Act that we like is that there will be provision for inf infringement notices if people aren't compliant with that request. But Megan, you might like to add to that. So, budget, science. Uh, through the chair, so just generally we have had discussions as this committee about signage and um, finding budget for signs when required. We just had that discussion about dogs um, just a while ago. So in the long term, yes, we do not have specific budget, though funding is found when new um, bylaws come into place. Specifically for the types of compliance and enforcement that has been undertaken, for example, at Hibiscus Coast for hot spots in the summer, it is a package that works together of compliance, which letting people know through signage and other methods what the rules are, and then having compliance officers talk to people and move them on. So we can confirm that that will be occurring in hot spots this summer, but there will always be discussions around long-term funding of signage for compliance, and we, of course, can take your um, comments as a suggestion, as per the resolutions being put to this committee, to add back into the feedback, to bring back in terms of advice on the future. So, so just coming back to my question, are we going to see more signs? in all of the locations where it's desirable, and particularly the locations where people and communities bring the issue to our attention. So through the Chair, as stated, we can bring that advice back to you in the new term for you to consider long term how that goes with whatever freedom camping approach you have in the future. For summer, we will run the hot spot compliance and enforcement as was run in Hibiscus Coast last summer. So that is the answer. There's not going to be a long-term fixture of all signage across the region for summer. It will be hotspot focused. Now, just a further question. Is it not possible to have a report back to this council before the election? There's some urgency around this. I, I think we've, we've got a very constrained time frame now, uh, and the next governing body will be taken up uh, in significant part by the valedictories of those people um, who are stepping down. Uh, I think what would be important is summer is the time when freedom camping becomes an issue. Uh, we will have, I think, three governing bodies in, uh, in November. One will be the formal swearing in. Uh, the, other, the other two will be working sessions. And there will be the opportunity uh, at that point and through November um, to, to perhaps have a workshop on the issue that will encompass compliance, signs, uh, and, and what we can do for this summer. Right, we have a question from Councillor Stewart. Thank you. Just um, maybe if you can answer me this, just on the general rule that regu regulates freedom camping outside restricted prohibited areas not listed on the proposed bylaw, you have here that a prohibit prohibitation of a freedom camping vehicle parked directly outside a residential home, it can happen unless the resident 
has granted permission for the vehicle to be parked outside their home. The concern, and, and maybe you can answer, is the concern is that what is now happening, people are actually paying like a rent, they're actually renting to be able to park outside a person's property. And this is something that is actually happening. And there's also um, a lot of these uh, camper vans that are parking outside residential property, um, you, you see they're getting power from, they're being powered from, from residential houses. So people in the, in, in the neighbourhood aren't happy um, with having um, these camper vans or they're not even just camper vans, it might be just a van or um, parked outside and the way, the way things are going at the moment with people that are struggling to find rental accommodation, this seems to be happening more and more. So can you just explain what we can do there? It's just, yeah. it's just it is a bit concerning that um, an owner or somebody renting a property might say to take rent from somebody and allow them to stay there for quite some time. Because the other residents in the street aren't happy with it. Well, I think that comes down to time frames. If you're talking about freedom camping, um, freedom camping is not an excuse for somebody to be parked uh, in one place indefinitely. Um, we're talking about freedom camping, the people that are visiting the area as tourists, and under most general rules, there will be a time frame set down as to the appropriateness of how long somebody should be there. We are, however, constantly finding, trying to find balance, because you might have some relatives up from Wellington, and they come up in their camper van, they've been touring the city, and they want to stop at your place and park out on, you know, you might want them up their driveway. If you've got a driveway, that's how you'd accommodate them. Um, but I don't want to be overly bureaucratic and say to people, well, you can't have your friends from um, down country parking outside your place for a day. You'd, you'd say that, you know, we're, we're being authoritarian and we're being busybodies, etc. So it's finding that balance, Councillor, I think. But uh, uh, Megan uh, or Katarina, you might like to say something further about that? Just to clarify, there will be a range of issues and different perceptions people have, and that's one of the reasons why the resolutions provide clear direction for staff to proceed on, but also allow us to provide you back with advice around what those range of issues might be to consider. If I just can just, just further on to that, um, just if you can just answer, we, we have a, a situation that I'm sure that you're aware of, of um, in the Uxbridge car parking in Howick, where there's somebody that, that's been parking a camper van for probably five or six months and he leaves it there during the day and sometimes if he, if he um, the enforcement people have it locked into it, sometimes if, if somebody comes and knocks on his, on his door, he, he'll move it and he'll move it to a private car park somewhere up the road and then the next morning it's there and it's there all day. You see the windows open, having cups of tea, it's obvious a... So how how can we how how can we um, sort that situation out? I think through the chair. Look, that's quite site specific. Perhaps I could speak to councillor afterwards, and we can just make sure we continue to deal with that. Thank you. Right, we now come to comments, and councillor Newman, you had uh, indicated a, a desire to comment. Yeah, just briefly, your worship. Um, I just want to make a a comment with respect to the decision um, of those councillors who voted differently on the general rule matter previously at the regulatory committee and I was one of them and just to say this that was well, certainly speaking for myself the concern was uh, that when you have a bylaw with infringement powers and you apply a general rule uh, look there are people in my ward who are rough sleeping they are sleeping in their vehicles uh, and there was a concern about how an infringement bylaw might apply to them exercising a general rule. Now, I think that um, you've tried to address this, um, obviously, through the um, uh, Roman numeral 4D, um, and that's appropriate. But I'm sure that this will still be a matter for discussion um, at, the, um, at the next hearings uh, on the statement proposal to come during the next term. 
But I also want to say, uh, Your Worship, that I want to acknowledge uh, Councillor Cooper and uh, in particular, but also Councillor Hulse and, and um, Member Hanare, because I think this has been a very difficult, time-consuming exercise, uh, not an easy situation whereby um, legislation passed by Parliament has consequences which significantly um, constrain our ability to manage an activity that actually that is being mandated by Parliament. But in saying that, Your Worship, uh, I'd also want to acknowledge you and uh, your leadership on this matter, which I think does respond to a widely held concern in the community uh, and to move the, uh, I guess, the, the onus back on to uh, the council to come up with rules that place the quiet enjoyment of residents in their community uh, ahead of the Freedom Campers is something that I think the community will appreciate. So I certainly want to give notice that I will have a list of sites uh, that I wish to have uh, considered for inclusion in the statement proposal before the 30th of September. Um, and I want to thank officers in advance um, for their consideration of this because there are certainly sites in my ward where there I think that we do need to uh, consider those sites and include them for, in the schedule for sites to be where freedom camping will be prohibited, um, as well as other sites which where freedom camping may be allowed, but it will be allowed on on restricted um, terms. So um, thank you for for um, item ten, and I'm happy to vote for those recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Watson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and, and I too would just like to uh, commend uh, your role in this. Uh, clearly, responding to the, the feedback from right across Auckland um, for a tighter regime, um, and, and it's good to see you've written to the minister, and, and because I think that's a sentiment that's kind of held right across New Zealand, um, and too often we, um, as a council, have been reluctant to I think take that approach a little more. Uh, forcefully than has been the case in the past. Um, certainly, when the super city was set up, there was <laughs> there was a there was a there was a observation made that um, the Auckland Council might present some sort of challenge to to the government, to Parliament, um, in terms of a, a powerhouse. I don't think that's eventuated, but uh, at all. But it is good to see in instances like that where, you know, the balls. Kick back down to their side of the field because they have created this situation um, that that we have been aware of in our various communities for quite some time are having perverse effects. Um, so, so, and I, and I think a number of your suggestions will go some way to to dealing with those perverse effects. And I think particularly of the, you know, the the prohibition on um, re reserves in residential areas uh, and the general rule. You know the notion that people just can't come along and park outside other people's property and affect the, you know, the amenity of their life. That's highly desirable and, and and pragmatic. And I would just say in passing, it it does reflect the views of a number of people in the regulatory committee who were pushing for a more restrictive regime, tried to get additional sites added as prohibited, weren't satisfied with the general rule. Um, not just from the point of view of a humanity to the homeless. I mean, that they're the last people who should then be getting persecuted for not being able to <laughs> to have a roof over their head, then getting moved on from you know some area they're trying to survive. But also with the the general rule as it would have existed, and that was where people could just rock up for 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 two nights, and then maybe if they're in prime spots, get replaced by someone else for another two nights. That wasn't clearly going to deal with the situation either. So that was uh, a little bit more background to that um, discontent with the, with the general rule. I also <coughs> really appreciate your comments, Mr Mayor, that allude to the opportunities for council to exist. And one of the hot spots, the Hibiscus Coast and Oriwa, there is a lovely big council camping ground 100 metres along the road mm. that is not at full capacity for large parts of the year. Why on earth, if the cost is reasonable, would you have people camping free next to it and your council-owned facility that is catering for those people not being used? And even if that meant some 
you know, reorganisation of the facilities that were, or perhaps a more basic facility for the, for the drive and I don't know. But that is something we should be picking up, N not just in our area, up in Council of Sayers, another hot spot, where they have two other beautiful council campgrounds at Whangatiao and Martins Bay that are ideal for this type of, of camping. So I think we should be pushing that as you have you know, suggested yourself too. Uh, and I would just say, given you know, recent events, for the safety of the campers too. I know a number of these sites I've seen that are identified that are suitable in the sense that they're away from communities, but they're not suitable for campers. They're rather isolated. And if people are by, there by themselves, uh, as we have found out in, in recent times, there is a danger to, to, to the people coming from overseas camping. Um, finally, as far as the enforcement goes, that was reassuring from Megan, I think went quite some way to uh, satisfying the concerns of the Hibiscus Coast Board in terms of the use of interns and concentrating on the spots that, that are problems. So that, that, that's good. The beach wardens is a good idea in some communities. Every single beach uh, on Hibiscus Coast used to have wardens. <coughs> and I know now there's no shortage of volunteers. Mm. Uh, people actually come forward and say, look, we remember we had wardens, we'd be willing to do that. And they are appropriate people. You know, we, 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 don't, we don't want um, little Hitlers, but, but I, I'm sure there's any number of people that could do that. And that would be a good community spirit. Uh, and it goes to other things. As far as signage goes, <laughs> we have had uh, issues that have been solved by good signage. Set netting, we had uh, a, a saga that rolled on for five years. It was solved by two good signs put down in Arkles Bay. The problem went away overnight. Some of our signage, like election signs I might add, some are more effective than others than standing out and hitting people between the eyes. Our signage sometimes can be a bit small. Steve Pearce has made admirable efforts to secure signage that sees people, I would suspect that good signage in the right place, clearly visible, will solve 95% of the problems in the immediate future. So once again, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you for your intervention. I think we're on a much better road now. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor Walker. So um, I'll follow on directly from my fellow Albany Ward Councillor, John Watson, and I agree with all of the comments. Com comments and sentiments that John raised. I was also one of the councillors to vote against the, the general rule that was being put up because equally I was dissatisfied with that. Um, and, and I want to add further to the comments that John is making around facilities. John's talking about existing um, camping grounds. My suggestion is that we need to look at new areas. They don't have to be prime sites on beachfronts, for example, as at Oriwa, what are these people looking for? One, they're interested in security, and I'd suggest there's even more need for that. Two, they're interested in toilet, ideally um, a shower. And three, they want somewhere that's not so far off the beaten track. It's an overnight facility that they need, not necessarily one at a prime location. So can we do some work around that? We have massive amounts of land all around Auckland, in industrial areas, in commercial areas, in many locations that would be suitable. What does it take for us to act on this? So I want to put that up. Secondly, there's a critical requirement, as Councillor Watson mentioned, for signs. Those signs can be simple, they can be cheap, we can operate in collaboration with the community. I'm sure there are many people in the community that will be happy to put up signs in appropriate locations if we empower them. And equally, we should be looking at a voluntary regime similar to the beach warden regime that Rodney District Council had. I was a beach warden, one of many. We used to have regular meetings, we were trained, we knew what to do, and it was effective because certainly in Rodney, which was near enough half the Auckland region in terms of size, that particular council recognised that it was impossible to enforce without a regime that worked with the community. So what I see going forward is an imperative for us to work with the community, because these people that are freedom camping, some of them are smart. They'll shift. They'll come back. They'll shift somewhere else. And the problem doesn't go away. The only way you deal with that is by having people on the ground and effective signage to cover the base.
So let's get on with that, and it's urgent. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And to conclude, Councillor Simpson. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Cooper as well. Councillor Simpson. Oh, Your Worship, you know, if you felt a, a warm breeze through the door of your office on level 27 on Monday, it was probably the collective sigh of relief from half of Auckland when they read your paper. Um, I, I absolutely want to thank you and your staff for the work that you have done around this. Um, I know from uh, personal experience, I have spoken to a number of the people in your office, and so have a number of people who uh, are from my ward. I want to acknowledge somebody in the room. Um, I'm probably not going to name you, just for your own protection, maybe. But there is a person here today who has come and spent time with your office, spent time with your staff, spent time with me, who understands this better than all of us put together, I would think. She's done a huge amount of work. Councillor Sayers, you know who I'm talking about. And I think that she needs to be acknowledged as well. There are people out there in the community who were so upset that they got all sorts of legal help and other help to help them, you know, get the right conclusion. I believe that you have done what any good mayor should have done and have listened. And there is no reason that anybody around this table could not vote for every one of your recommendations. I have a few issues with the process that's happened up to this point, and I'm not going to highlight them because I don't think that's helpful at all. But I will make a couple of comments. I think people like Māori wardens and beach wardens are a great concept, and they're out there, we know they're out there, we need to spend some more time about that. Um, I also think that there are a couple of process issues. When councillors make a decision like we do on this bylaw, we have to be involved in the process around that consultation. I believe there's been a disconnect and I think that needs to somehow change. Um, the second highest feedback on restriction was around Tamaki Drive and I, like other councillors um, and local boards, I'm sure, will have quite a healthy list for you by the end of September and I think you have given adequate time frame for that. You've given five weeks. Every local board will have a meeting if they want to resolve on that. And I think one of the process issues was that local boards were not able to feed back after they had heard back from their communities. And I think if we use them correctly, that's probably been, a, been something that we need to look at. But I 100% support your uh, recommendations. And if you hadn't put them up, I tell you, I would have been having a, a good go at them myself. So thank you very much. Thank your staff very much. And I absolutely 100% uh, support every single one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And to conclude, Councillor Cooper. Thank you. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but there's some things that have been said that make it sound as if the panel did not consider a lot of what's been said here, and we absolutely did, and we addressed a lot of it. Um, the other issue for me is this conversation around the general rule. Um, a lot of what's talked about here, all oh, these people move on and come back, those people are not frigging campers. They're often beneficiaries who get 200, between 200 and lucky 300 a, a week. You cannot afford to pay for a, you know, $27 every night it's nearly all of their, their benefit because they're not freedom campers. Um, so absolutely understand people had concerns, but you can't have it both ways. You can't say, oh, we've got to be compassionate with um, homeless people, but then say, no, they can't stay anywhere and they must go to a camp. So I think there's a lot of work to go. And we can, you know, I can hear a lot of derisive laughter, you know, around this whole thing, but this is going to happen again. We've got to do it all again. It's not a done deal yet. We're just putting off the fateful day unless we get a legislative change, which I really hope we do, because it's a piece of um, legislation that's actually unworkable. It's permissive unless you prohibit, rather than prohibited unless you permit, which would be much more workable. Um, you know, we've got, we've got some people saying, oh, it shouldn't be out of the way places. No, well, we took those out of the way. We took them out because some of our southern local boards were absolutely clear that people could be harmed if they stayed in places. And then we've got some people saying, oh, let's use industrial areas. Well, they're the very places where people get killed. We had that as a poor security guard 
in an industri a, a lonely industrial area in Henderson. So you can't say one thing and then want another. It just doesn't work. So we've got to find a sensible way forward. Um, and I'm very clear that at our regulatory meeting when, this, when the general rule was taken out, is that it was all thinking about the homeless. It wasn't thinking about you know, your friends Marjorie and Jim who used to live in Remuera but now live in the Hawke's Bay and want to come up and stay in their beautiful self-contained camper van. But they can't because you haven't got any parking places in your property and you're not allowed to stay outside. And so we've got to think about the balance here. I was just in Hobsonville Point a couple of weekends ago and looked like a friend was staying outside someone's terrace house because they haven't got enough room for their friends to stay in their driveway, but they were just staying outside visiting their friends. And so we've got to find a balance where we allow that to happen because most of the problems are really from people that are homeless. And already in the proposed the statement of proposal that we already had said we will deal with those people in a compassionate way. And that's why the Mayor said, let's transfer that over. It's not as if we didn't deal with it. And our compliance staff said to us at that meeting, we will do that. We know the difference. And our staff do know the difference because they deal with it all the time. And so I think we could find a balance. Um, the other thing around signage, we dealt with that too. But it's, we can't cost that out until we have the actual proposal. We don't know what we're actually proposing. So we actually can't be going how much it's going to cost before we start because we don't even know what the new statement of proposal will be. So that's a bit of a red herring at the moment. But my understanding is that we did get $200,000 from, I think he's the Minister of Tourism, um, to help us with freedom camping. It's a drop in the bucket, but it's a start because prior to that, only provinces got that, even though we are a province. Um, Auckland wasn't considered, we were considered too wealthy to get that. So that's actually broken that glass ceiling, as you said, Mr Mayor, that we might get some support with that. Um, I hope that in the next term, Mr Mayor, we take the regulatory committee a bit more seriously and the reading of the agendas and the actual what's there and that we have more people on that because this is our bread and butter. And as we've seen with the number of submissions, people really care about this stuff because it affects them. It affects them in their daily lives and we all need to take responsibility for it. And in terms of that, um, you know, I'm really grateful that even though Councillor Hulse wasn't even on the committee, she was the only one that put her hand up, apart from me, to actually do this. You know, we need some real engagement. We can't stand outside, you know, of it. We're supposed to be the decision makers and help contribute and listen to people. So I hope that we do that. And I just want to note finally that we heard loud and clear from local boards that they want to distill the information that we've already heard from the public. They want to have another look at that. It will take longer. And this whole thing will take a long time. It cannot be done by Christmas um, because it took two years to get to this point. And so hopefully it'll be a bit less. And we did actually, I feel really sad because we actually promised that we'd have this ready by Christmas. But because of the lack of the general rule, that was the biggest issue for people. They were really con concerned. So we actually shot ourselves in the foot, unfortunately. So we won't have it ready by this Christmas. And that's unfortunate. But, so I hope our staff can do the best they can do. But the reality is, if we can't enforce it, we can only do inconsistent work across the region because the current public places bylaw is different in every old legacy bylaw. Some's two nights, some's one night, some's no night. So the public will be wondering what on earth's going on. Why can you let it here and not there? Well, this is what we're left with. So I look forward to the work in the next term if I'm here. Um, and um, thank you for coming to landing in this place and I hope everybody supports it. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much. And just uh, some very brief comments, because I've made most of my comments at the start. Uh, one, again, to acknowledge um, Councillor Cooper and Councillor Hulse. Um, when you put your hand up to be on a hearing panel, it's not an easy job. It's hours and hours and hours of work. And those people who put their hands up are really shouldering that burden on behalf of every one of us around this table. And I absolutely acknowledge the commitment, the integrity, uh, the integrity of the process 
uh, and the people that put that, that work into it. Uh, I should have mentioned that we did get a small amount of money out of the Minister in reply to Councillor Cooper in my letter, um, but actually that sum of money, when I think about it, would probably cover the equivalent amount that was spent in, uh, uh, in the Hibiscus and Bays Ward right across um, the region. And we never say no, and as you pointed out, that broke the glass ceiling, although the glass ceiling was also broken with a $5 million grant to ATED recently out of that central government funding. And speaking as Mayor of Auckland, we are part of the country. We're not to be excluded because we're bigger. Uh, our needs are not different on a per capita basis, so that's good. Look, I want to thank every councillor that participated in that debate um, for their comments. I think it's a clear example of where <coughs> The council has listened to what people have uh, have told us. Uh, you know that's that's our job. We've got to make a judgment in the end, and we won't always please all of the people. But it is really important that this council is seen to listen when people put forward in good faith their submissions to us through a process like we've been through. And I think we've taken that on board, <clears throat> and our recommendations reflect that. So I'll put those recommendations uh, as a block. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I'll declare that carried unanimously. Thank you very much.